Okay, welcome back to Marriage, Practice, and Procedure in Exile. This is video four. Uh, again, we are continuing with lesson eight, which is on the formal process. But we also are discussing really lesson nine at almost the same time, uh, because that concerns Pope Francis's marriage reforms in Metis Udex. Um, otherwise, as we go through Lesson 8, if we did not talk about Metis Udex, you would be left under a false impression about items uh, that were in the original 1983 code, but have since been modified. Okay, last time we, we talked about several things like competence, instances, um, number of judges, and exceptions, uh, things that go into the process. We're going to talk right now especially about how the process goes forward, what it looks like, what the sort of the steps on the conveyor belt are for a marriage nullity case. Now, you may know from Metis Udex that there's a new procedure called the briefer process. We're not going to talk about that now. We will talk about it in this um, video, probably, but we will not talk about it now. So just keep that in mind that that's, that's on hold for a few minutes. Okay, in the... Um, the, the type of process we're talking about is called the contentious trial or process. Uh, that's just the name of it. Uh, that's, that's the process that's used for marriage cases. Uh, the, first, the first stage is the introduction of the case. And what usually happens here is that the, the petitioner works with his or her pastor and says, look, I would like my marriage judged and sort of here's my here's my story. That's probably where you're you're more likely to be involved in the process is at the very at the very beginning. And you may be able to provide some assistance in helping the helping the person think about possible grounds. Um, possible reasons their marriage might be might be null. You should never promise that their marriage will be declared null because of any reason, but say a pregnancy. Say there's been a pregnancy before the marriage. Um, you should never promise that the marriage will be declared null, but you may be able to help them think of possible grounds and encourage them to take advantage of the process um, either just to see what they can find out or because you, you may have a strong indication that there are legitimate grounds for nullity. Okay, so we're in this introductory phase and the petitioner is working with his or her pastor. There's an interview. Um, what usually happens is the petitioner is asked to fill out a questionnaire and you as the pastor may or may not uh, help her with that. Um, they they may they may need help, and you may provide that help, or it may be someone else in the parish. You may have someone who um, assists people with their nullity petitions. Indianapolis trains people to do this, and they call they call these people field associates. Okay, after that happens, after the questionnaire is filled out, it's sent to the tribunal. And uh, then the judicial vicar will draft what is called a libellus. Um, in civil law, this would be called a complaint. But this is a short document stating who the parties are and what the petitioner is seeking. It's a very short document. Um, if you want to see it described, you can look in Dignitatis Canubii. You probably have the green version, but Dignitatis Canubii articles 115 and 116 telling you about the contents. But it's a, essentially a very brief document, uh, the parties and um, the possible grounds for nullity are uh, uh, what may be included. Okay, um, 
the judicial vicar then will constitute a tribunal. And as we said last time, at least under the original code, the idea was that most tribunals would be collegial. They would have three judges. As we also said, that's kind of changing, but let's assume for now it's going to be a three-judge uh, tribunal. The chief judge is called the ponens, sometimes also called the praesis, P-R-A-E-S-E-S, -E -E but ponens is, uh, is a more common, more common term. That's the chief judge of the of the panel, and and the um, the decision will be made whether to admit or reject the libellus, um, and either the ponens or the judicial vicar will make this decision. Um, Dignitatis Canubii one twenty one tells us possible reasons for rejecting a libellus. What might be um, what might be a reason for uh, for uh, rejecting the libellus, something that should be in it, uh, but is is not contained there. If it's rejected, the petitioner uh, then can have recourse to the whole college of judges. Can say, look, the the the, the ponens made a wrong decision, so I want to appeal to the whole college, all three judges, or five. Usually it's going to be three, but sometimes it could be five. Um, okay, so but let's say the case is accepted uh, and it's going forward. What happens next? The next thing is that the respondent is, remember the person bringing the case is the petitioner, and the tribunal has now decided to accept it. The respondent is cited, is cited. What cited means is they're basically sent a summons. They're told that, look, your spouse is seeking nullity of your marriage, and uh, here's how you can how you can participate. Uh, and that that citing or citation should include a copy of the libellus, so the um, respondent knows what's what the subject of the petition is. Article 127 of DC, however, says that for a grave reason, the ponens can decide to withhold the libellus from the, from the respondent until the respondent has given his or her, uh, his or her evidence. Um, that should be a very rare thing. Um, uh, but it, uh, it is a possibility. Okay, after this, after the citing of the respondent, the next, the next thing, we're still in the introductory phase of the case, but now we're at the very end of it. And what happens at the end of the introductory phase is what's called the joinder of the issue, also called the litus contestatio. What does that mean? Well, DC Article 135 calls this the formulation of the doubt. This is the formulation of the doubt, the joinder of the issue, the litus contestatio, whatever of those three things you want to call it. That's the precise point that this case is going to decide. Uh, so it's essentially going to be whether this marriage is null because of such and such a, a ground, because of consanguinity, because of lack of due discretion, etc. Um, okay, so before the joinder of the issue, the parties are consulted, and what the judge will do is issue a decree establishing what the litus contestatio is, what the precise question is going to be that uh, the case goes forward with. And then he also will set dates for the gathering of evidence, and the, the gathering of evidence is going to be the next stage of the case. Um, now, let's say the judge sets, establishes what the litus contestatio is, but you disagree. He says that it's going to be lack of due discretion, but you think it should be lack of due competence. Um, you could, uh, you again could appeal to the college. So let's say the, the ponens has established that the litus contestatio is 
going to be about whether the marriage is null because of lack of due discretion and you think it should be lack of due reason or lack of due competence, you could um, have recourse to the full college of judges, all three judges, and uh, uh, make your case. But let's, let's assume the case is going forward now. The next phase is called the instruction of the case. What this really means is the gathering of evidence. Um, and uh, what um, one thing to know is that the, the evidence is mostly going to be documentary evidence. You have started the case. You're the petitioner. You have started the case by filling out a questionnaire. The respondent also will be allowed to fill out a questionnaire and so will the witnesses that you both name. Sometimes testimony is taken live um, in front of the uh, in front of the judge, and uh, really, it's the judge who asks the questions. It's not the um, uh, the the other the parties, or even if they have canonists uh, helping them. The canonists do not ask questions. They can suggest questions to the judge, but the judge asks the questions if you have the, the live testimony. Um, but often a lot of the a lot of the uh, the proofs, the evidence is going to be documents. It's going to be what the various witnesses uh, write down. Um, okay, so so all of kind of all of these things are um, are kind of gathered and it takes, you know, can take a it just depends how soon people send in uh, or whether they send in the documents that they're asked to they're asked to fill out uh, once once that happens once all of the evidence is gathered um, you have what is the conclusion of the case what happens then is that the parties and their counsel uh, they get to see all the evidence and to inspect and comment on it Usually they get to see all of the documents. There is a canon, though, uh, 1598, Section 1, that says for a grave reason, um, some of the evidence can be withheld from a party. Uh, a lot of canonists believe that this is this should not be permitted. What, what essentially the, the purpose of it is is that... Um, if one of the parties is, say, very volatile or violent, and there's something in the evidence that's very inciting to that person, um, or endangers the witness because the witness has has said something about him, then uh, that evidence may be withheld from him. You could really get into problems of injustice here, though, because if the case is going to be decided on the basis of this evidence, uh, really the parties the parties should have a, uh, the right to look at the evidence and to respond to it. Um, okay, so, so the evidence has been gathered and both parties and the defender of the bond have had the chance to inspect it and comment on it. Um, then in a sense, the case is concluded, at least the evidence part of it. And now it's time for arguments. So first, the advocate for the petitioner presents his or her arguments, and uh, then the defender of the bond presents his or her arguments. And if the respondent is represented or wants to do so on his or her own, uh, he can he or she can respond as well. Then comes the judgment. Um, if you're following in Woodall, this would be around page 507 of the Woodall text. The judge should, should find for nullity only if he is morally certain. The standard he needs to have is moral certainty. So that's a pretty high standard. It's not just that there's a probability that the uh, marriage is null, but that he's he's really quite certain he's morally certain so it's a it's a pretty high standard um, keep in mind from canon 1060 you'll remind you'll, you'll remember this from canon law 2 canon 1060 marriage enjoys the favor of the law so 
a marriage does not have to be proven valid. A marriage is assumed to be valid. If you want to say the marriage is invalid, you're the one who needs to bring the proof forward. Um, okay, good. You have the judgment, then what happens? Then, then is the time for appeals. If uh, Now again, there used to be, before 2015, there was a mandatory appeal, and the, uh, the parties couldn't remarry, even if they had an affirmative decision for nullity, they couldn't remarry until they had a second conforming sentence. Um, now, though, there is no automatic appeal, so there's only an appeal if one of the parties, uh, the petitioner, the respondent, or the defender, uh, wants to appeal. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, that is basically the process, but there's also, there's also something that's like an appeal, but it's called nullity of sentence. And this is where you're, when you appeal, you know, you're, you're, in a sense, you're attacking the judgment of the court. You're saying they were wrong. They um, found against me, and they should have found for me, or they found for me, but they found it on the wrong, on the wrong ground. They should have found a different ground, something like that. Um, nullity of sentence, it's like an appeal, except that it's about procedural irregularities. So you would be complaining about the sentence, but because of something in legal procedure, not substantive marriage law. So for example, uh, you may say that the court, the tribunal was not competent. Uh, that the case was brought in a in a tribunal that should not have heard the case. That would be one reason. If you're the respondent, you may say, I did not get my right of defense. We we're talking about withholding documents. Let's say they withhold a whole they withheld a whole bunch of documents. They turned out to be the key documents. I'd never got a a chance to respond to them, and they turned out to be very important. Uh, um, I, I think I could have called those documents into question. So has the respondent's right of defense been honored? Another possible, another possible attack on the sentence has to do with, with what's called motivation. You might say uh, the sentence was not motivated. Motivation has a different term, a different meaning here than our usual understanding of the term. What motivation means is that no reasons were given. They just said the marriage is null because of lack of due discretion, but they didn't give the reasons. They didn't talk about the facts. They didn't talk about the law. They just did a very short sentence that didn't uh, give the, the reasons for their conclusion. In that sense, we would call that an unmotivated sentence. They, they did not provide any reasons. Um, okay, good. That's kind of the end of the process. We've kind of gone through the introductory phase, the instruction of the case, the conclusion, the arguments, the judgment, and then the appeals. That's, that's basically the process. I think we talked about this earlier in the semester as well, but um, if, you, if you like, Woodall has a pretty good, uh, a pretty good schema of how the, um, the different steps in the, in the case, and that's in uh, chapter 18. Uh, I forget the page, but it's around 507, 511 there, but you'll see it. It's kind of a table. Just keep in mind, some of the steps that he includes, they've changed somewhat on the basis of Metis Udex. Okay, um, let's talk now about... Um, Oh, I should make, let me, let me mention just two other, two other points. What is that in a lot of cases, um, experts will be involved. So the, an expert will give a, will give a report. Often the witnesses are going to be people who observe the marriage. They're going to be, um, you know, family members or close friends who may be able to weigh in and say, this is, this was the type of marriage that it was. Here's um, here's what it was. Here's what it was like. Here's what the couple was like when they were when they were courting or shortly after they were married. 
But there also may be a need for expert opinion, especially if there are psychological grounds uh, for the case, uh, such as lack of due competence. Uh, you may have the report of a psychologist. Another thing that I, I believe we've talked about, but um, sometimes the nullity will be granted, but the court also will issue either a monotum or a vetitum. And what that means is that, uh, look, something went wrong in this marriage, and it may have been on the part of the petitioner as well, uh, or on the part of both parties. So they might say, look, there was a there was a real difficulty here with their understanding of marriage or a real difficulty with their ability to undertake the obligations of marriage. So for one or both parties, we're going to put a monotum on that person saying that um, there, there needs to be a warning before uh, he or she can be married again, and maybe some type of counseling would be required. A vetitum is even more serious. With a vetitum, they're actually prohibited from marrying again um, until they have uh, they have the essentially the approval of the chancery. And again, that's probably going to involve some counseling or some type of measure to make sure they don't make the same mistake in their next marriage that they made in their in their first one. Um, oh, by the way, I found the chart of where Woodall has the steps of the process. It's 510 to 512. So again, it's quite good, but just keep in mind some of the things, as we've said, have changed a little bit with, uh, uh, with Betis Udex. Uh, let's see. One other thing I just want to tell you is that this is another change with Metis Udex. If you look in your code at Canon 1676, it tells you that a judge is obliged to try to persuade parties to reconcile, uh, that he shouldn't take the case until he first uh, tries to get the parties to reconcile. That provision was actually taken away by Pope Francis. So... Uh, the new corresponding canon is Canon 1675, and it no longer obliges the judge to uh, to uh, persuade the parties to reconcile. I think it has something similar, but less strong. It says something like the judge should be should proceed when he's convinced that there is no uh, chance of reconciliation, but it doesn't say that he's obliged to uh, try to get the parties to reconcile. Okay. Um, all right. We said before that we would, um, we were putting on hold this new type of process called the briefer process. This comes from Metis Udex. And, uh, when Metis Udex uh, came around in late 2015, you may have remembered seeing it covered in the news. You, you may not, but um, what was uh, what the news said, if, if you saw any of those stories, was that this was going to be a new, much quicker way to obtain a decree of nullity. Um, so you have people now who come and say, I want the 45-day nullity decree. Well, there is no such thing as a 45-day nullity decree. Even at its quickest, the process is still going to take at least three to six months. So some of the reporting about how quick the process might be was really in error. Uh, so now this briefer process um, is a real innovation. It's one of the one of the biggest innovations in Metis Udex. And um, what, it, what it does, it provides a way to have this quicker process if certain conditions are satisfied. And here are the conditions. Number one, both spouses must petition. So the spouses are in agreement. Both spouses petition together or else only one spouse petitions, but the other consents. So essentially, both spouses are in agreement that they want nullity. They want uh, the marriage declared null. And then the second condition is that nullity must be manifest. It's established by either testimony or by documents, and these things do not require further investigation. So essentially, it's it's a it should be a quite clear case 
for nullity and one where both spouses agree in desiring nullity. Well, what happens in such a case? Um, the the uh, the, uh, the the what happens is the diocesan bishop is the one to judge this type of case. So when the case comes in, the judicial vicar will decide, does this look like a case that could be judged under the briefer process? And if so, he names an instructor and an assessor. Remember, the instructor is the person who gathers, who gathers evidence. The assessor is going to help evaluate the evidence. Uh, the judicial vicar then names everyone who has to participate in a session to be held within 30 days. He wants to get all of the potential witnesses together in a pretty quick period, within 30 days. And then the evidence also is reviewed by defend the defender of the bond, and the acts and the report of the instructor are presented to the bishop. Um, and then the bishop issues his sentence. The bishop actually decides this case here. The pope is trying to get uh, bishops to exercise their judicial authority more directly here. Uh, again, a big innovation. There are two ways a case like this can end. Either affirmative, the bishop says, yes, the marriage is null, and uh, that's my decision, or the case is looked at and says this was not this case was not right for the briefer process, uh, and in that case it's sent back and is handled just like an ordinary nullity case, not on the fast track, not in the briefer process. It will just go through the ordinary process. So interestingly, with the briefer process, there are no negative decisions. There's either an affirmative decision or else it's go back and handle this case like an ordinary. An ordinary process. Um, that is, those are really the basics of the briefer process. And uh, in the the Beal, the John Beal article that you have on this, uh, this should be very clear. The Beal article is very very good. What is uh, interesting though is in Metis Udex, there also is a list of possible factual situations that the Pope indicated might indicate the um, appropriateness of the briefer process. And this list is somewhat controversial. The reason is that uh, some of the things the Pope lists are actual grounds for nullity, but not all of them are. Um, and some of the circumstances that the Pope lists uh, they don't necessarily indicate the nullity of a marriage. So uh, they, they seem to be sort of helpful or signposts that were intended to be helpful. Uh, some, um, some canonists have said it might have been better not to give this list of exemplary uh, situations. Remember, uh, if you have Dignitatis Canubii in the hard copy, you have the, uh, the green copy with commentary by two canonists, Ludicky and Jenkins. Jenkins is a Texas canonist, a very well thought of, named Ronnie Jenkins. And Jenkins, um, Monsignor Jenkins has said that uh, he didn't really give his own opinion, but he says many people think that uh, perhaps this, this list creates more problems than than it solves. So anyway, this list is found in Metis Udex, Article 14, Section 1. It's a list of possible factual situations that may make the briefer process appropriate. So I'll just go through them quickly and make a couple comments. One is defect of faith. What that means is if someone um, has a, for instance, if they're a Christian, but they don't believe in the sacramentality of marriage, then and not, not, not only don't believe in it, but they exclude it. Remember, excluding the sacramentality of marriage, um, that's, a, uh, that's a type of simulation. So that could, prevent, uh, that could prevent the marriage from being valid. That's one situation. Now Jenkins, in making a comment about this, uh, says that um, this case seems quite like a, the type of case that would be quite complex 
So it's hard to see that type of case really being resolved through the briefer process. Again, there's Jenkins' view. Uh, another, another factual situation that might give rise to the brief, briefer process, a short conjugal cohabitation. The spouses only live together a short time after marriage. And that's just kind of common sense. Look, if things went so went went badly so quickly that perhaps there was a problem from the very start. I think a lot of people would would agree and say that is a um, at least a yellow flag, maybe a red flag indicating that there's could be a real problem with the marriage. Um, another instance, abortion procured to avoid procreation. Um, the, the woman got an abortion to avoid having children. Again, exclusion of children is a is simulation, exclusion of the bonum, the bonum prolis. Um, obstinate persistence in an extraconjugal relationship. Uh, you're seeing more than one person. You marry one, but you continue the physical relationship with the other one. Obviously, we have a big problem with uh, whether whether you understand marriage as being exclusive. It seems that exclusivity or fidelity is being excluded. Uh, so again, a situation that might um, might give rise to the briefer process. Also, if you conceal something from the other spouse that would be of real significant concern to them, such as your sterility, a grave contagious illness that you have, children from a previous relationship, or your incarceration. Um, again, I don't know that everybody would, would uh, necessarily agree that all of those give rise to nullity, but they're, again, at least signposts that the Pope gives us to say maybe maybe the briefer process is helpful here. Unexpected pregnancy. Um, right now, as you know, in the past, if there's an unexpected pregnancy, people usually would get married very quickly. Right now, most pastors say that these marriages are ill-considered, and so it's probably better for the couple not to get married until afterwards when they don't have the pressure of the pregnancy. Um, so again, don't, if there was a pregnancy before the marriage and it broke up fairly soon after that, it, it, uh, that might be an indication of nullity. But not, not always. Just because there is an unexpected pregnancy, that does not mean that the marriage necessarily is invalid. So we have to be careful with some of these situations. Another one, physical violence to extort consent. Um, there, that would probably be a pretty obvious case of, of nullity, uh, where one spouse was threatening the other and so the other agreed to to marry him because of the because of the violence uh, or the threatened violence um, that pretty obviously would uh, um, would would compromise the the freedom of the the second spouse um, so again just be aware of these factual situations these factual situations are not the only ones that give rise to the briefer process. They're just some examples, but the real the real requirements are that the petition is put forward by both spouses or by one with the consent of the other, and that nullity is manifest. It's clear in the documents or in the testimonies, and it doesn't really require further investigation. Those are the real requirements for it. Um, I just want to give you a very quick summary of the big changes from Metis Udex, especially because you'll be writing about this. Um, we talked about competence in the last um, the last lecture, uh, lecture three. There, under the 1983 code, the, res um, the respondent was very much protected, uh, that usually the respondent had to be, uh, have the petition um, brought in his or her own diocese. So there was this um, real desire to, to, to protect the right of defense of the respondent. Under Metis Udex, there's more of a desire to help the petitioner, it seems, because now 
the respondent does not have that protection. Rather, the petitioner is very free in deciding where to uh, where to bring the case, and in fact can can bring the bring the petition in his own diocese, even if it's difficult for the respondent to um, to defend the case there. Okay, and we talked about the mandatory appeal, also called the conforming sentence. That was a requirement that existed for almost 300 years, from 1741 until 2015. And uh, that was to ensure that nullity was not granted too easily, that two courts looked at the same case and they agreed on the judgment and they agreed on the grounds. That has been taken away, so now... Um, uh, now there is no mandatory appeal. Uh, the the parties can act on the uh, decision of only one tribunal, uh, as long as there's been there's been no appeal. And uh, another big change is that uh, now, whereas the norm used to be a collegial tribunal of three judges, um, now. Pope Francis has cleared the way to have more cases decided by just a single judge. So if you combine that, the number of judges, together with the abolition of the mandatory appeal, we would say that probably in the past, a nullity case would have been looked at by, by six judges. Three judges in first instance and three judges in the mandatory appeal. And now, probably a case would be viewed only by one judge because in the first instance, now there is no mandatory appeal. Now it's easier to try a case with just one judge and there's not going to be a second instance case unless someone appeals and most of the time no one does, neither of the parties nor the uh, defender of the bond. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.